I want to invite you to be turning to 1 Timothy quickly. 1 Timothy. Our God, He is a great communicator, is He not? Now, for those of us who knew, know our God and who He is, well, that certainly is not surprising. Because as our Creator, well, He's the one who has endowed man with the ability to speak. Friends, speech, just like knowledge, it begins, it originates with God. And so we would expect Him then to be a great communicator, which He is. And this ability, this privileged ability that He has given to man of speech, well, that permits us then to communicate and interact with one another but also with our God. And how eternally thankful that we should be that our God has chosen to communicate to us. And He's done that through this book, His revelation, we call the Bible. And friends, surely God's choosing to do this, communicate to us, It attests to his desire and his intent then for us to understand him. In other words, understand his word, what he has communicated to us, and thus understand his will for our lives. And we don't have to assume that, even though we can. We don't have to, because he says as much in his word time and time again. Think about, for instance, Jesus, God on the earth. He would sometimes preface his teaching with the exhortation to the audience, hear and understand, Matthew 15 and verse 10. Paul, writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, a member of the Godhead, he counsels Christians, wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is, Ephesians 5 and verse 17. I understand that there are some who would contend that the Bible, God's communication to man, is too complex. It's it's too difficult for us to understand. And notwithstanding that claim by some, I would hope that we, though we would humbly acknowledge and admit there are some things in God's revelation that are challenging to us, but at the same time, I hope that we confidently acknowledge that this revelation, this communication issues from a God who gave us the ability to speak, who is infinite in wisdom, and then clearly expresses to us He wants us to understand what He has revealed to us. And so I'll say it again, friends. Our God, He is a great communicator. And so desirous is God for man to understand his communication, his revelation to us, that he often accommodates us by employing speech that is obviously designed to help us to understand. You see, God is regularly presenting lofty spiritual realities and truths, concepts, and principles, but he does it in a way that we can better grasp them, comprehend them, yes, understand them. And and I offer all of these observations to bring us here to Paul's letters to Timothy and specifically have us notice the Holy Spirit's, through the inspired penman Paul, the Holy Spirit's presenting here the church as a house. A house. Now, why would God do that? No doubt to aid Timothy's and future readers like us our understanding some things about this sublime institution, the church. So let me draw your attention quickly to two passages, one in 1 Timothy and the second, uh, the other in 2 Timothy. Well, look at 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 5, uh, we'll start at verse 14. A purpose statement. Paul explains, These things write I unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how you ought to behave yourself, in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. Friends, the church corresponds to the house or the family of God. Christians, therefore, are God's children within His house. Now, friends, this family framework we're all familiar with. We all understand what it is to be part of a family 
to grow up in a household. And therefore, God uses that to help us understand this responsibility. Because this depiction of the church as a house or a family easily lends itself then to this responsibility for God's children to behave themselves in a way that is becoming of God's children. You ever use that, Priscilla, on children? You behave yourself in this house or when you go out. You behave yourself because you reflect on this house, on this family, on our name, on me. And so we understand that. And so here, Christians are urged to understand what God would have us see as a responsibility as His children. He wants us to behave ourselves in a certain way, in a way that, again, is becoming of our being His children. And so respectful and obedient, treating our brothers and sisters as we should, and many other things would correspond. And surely, surely we can appreciate and we do find instructive this imagery that God uses to communicate to us so that we can better understand as his children the need to behave ourselves, to govern our conduct. So question, question, would you like to be considered an obedient son or daughter by God? All right, look over in 2 Timothy. Look at 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy, we're going to look at uh, verses uh, 20, uh, just uh, verses 20 and 21. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 20 and 21. Same inspired penman, same recipient, the preacher Timothy, and here's what he says. But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, some to honor some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet or usable by the master and prepared unto every good work. Now, first of all, I would ask you to notice that the same figure is here being used to represent the church, a house. Here, Paul describes it as a great house. But the application drawn from the figure is quite different. You see, Christians are not being depicted here as children of a house, but vessels within the house of God. And so in keeping with that analogy and its application, it's not the behavior of children that is being considered, but the quality of the vessels. Are they honorable or dishonorable? And Paul helps us understand That is determined by the material that they are made of and by their usefulness to the owner of the house, namely God. Then, don't miss this, then Paul clearly sets forth the criteria for being a vessel of honor. Verse 21, among them, vessels of honor are prepared unto every good work. Question, question. Do you want to be considered a vessel of honor in God's house? Well, I confidently submit, I guess I'm making a presumption here, but I I confidently submit that all of us present here today, we would sincerely desire to be viewed by God, not as vessels of dishonor, but vessels of honor. And if I'm correct in that assumption, you know what that means? Each of us will take very seriously the responsibility of being prepared unto every good work. And that brings us back to a series of lessons that we started last week talking about the work of the church. Friends, the work of the church is a subject that should be of great interest to all of us who are children of God, all of us who are vessels in God's household because it is going to determine whether or not we are vessels of honor. Vessels of honor. 
And so we want to resume that study that we began last week. Now let me just say last week, among other things, we did point out that uh, the individual Christian has a personal responsibility in readying ourselves. Remember, that's the language that was used there. They are prepared. They are ready to every good work. And friends, we have a responsibility as Christians to ready ourselves, prepare ourselves to be effective workers in the church. Among points that we drew from that, and we didn't spend any time on this, but first of all, if we're going to be ready unto every good work, indispensable is our study and application of God's Word. That's what 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says. God has given us all Scripture. He's, it's inspired as God breathed. It's profitable for these things. To what end? So that the man or woman of God can be perfect, complete, notice, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. You see, you can't do that without the Bible. It's indispensable to our readying ourselves, our preparing ourselves, for all good works. What about 2 Timothy 2 and verse 15? Similarly, there we read with regards to the Scripture's role. Study, give diligence to show yourself approved unto God. Who's approved unto God? A workman that needs not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. If you don't want to be ashamed as God's workman, you have to know how to use the word of God. And the only way that happens is through a study and application and use of it. So we talked about that. We also talked about in readying ourselves, preparing ourselves to every good work. We need to respect God's prerogatives in defining what work it is that we're supposed to be doing and in distinguishing various roles and placing limitations, which is his prerogative to do as it pertains to these defined works. Having done all that, then we turned our attention to our primary focus. You see, friends, I'm going to let you do that. I think every Christian ought to be preparing ourselves to be effective workmen in Christ's vineyard. That's a personal responsibility. Sure, we can help one another in that, but that's a personal responsibility. However, friends, what if we spend all of our time preparing and never went to work? See, that's a possibility. I illustrated this, Dallas, with, with a farmer. Think about a farmer going in his field, getting the fields all ready, and never planting anything. Boy, the fields look great. But he spent all of his time in preparation, and he's not going to be productive because he never went to work. He never planted seed. And following that illustration, friends, even God's people can be guilty of that. We can spend so much time preparing ourselves to go to work that we never go to work. And so this is a call to action. That's what this series of, of studies and lessons are all about. It's a call for us who have readied ourselves to go to action. We need to go to work and effectively, consistently, productively labor toward the accomplishment of those missions, those works that God has appointed for us to do. And so, friends, I'm just urging myself and you to think about some motivations. Think about some incentives. I phrased it this way. I want to offer some points for us to ponder to encourage us to remain productive. Prepare ourselves for the work? Yes! But then go to work. Then remain productive by staying active, investing time and effort, heartily participating in those good works which God has foreordained that we should be walking in them in Christ. Ephesians 2 and verse 10. In other words, Harold, 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 11, this should resound in our ears as Christians and during this series. Now, therefore, perform the doing of it. See, that's a call to action. Paul commended these people for readying themselves, expressing their desire to be part of it, but then he goes on, now therefore perform the doing of it, that as there was a readiness to will, so there may be a performance. Uh, the ESV 
Angie on this verse says, so now finish doing it as well (laughs) so that your readiness in desiring it may be matched by your completing it out of what you have. You've readied yourself. You've expressed your interest in being involved. Now do it. Now do it. Perform the work. Finish the work. I hope that resounds in our ears throughout this series, throughout our lives as Christians. Continue to ready yourself. Continue to study and make application so that we can be a useful vessel of honor in God's house. But you got to go to work. We got to go to work. And so I'm just asking us to think about some points that hopefully will serve to motivate us to remain productive in regularly, yea, constantly engaging in the work that God has given us to do. Very quickly, let's do this one this morning. The propriety of it. The propriety, that should be a strong motivation. This word propriety, and and you might even see the word in here, it speaks to the quality of being proper. You see it? Close to it anyways, missing an E. Propriety, it's what is proper. Or another synonym, it's what is fitting. It's what is suitable. Tracy, this might be the easiest definition. It's what's right. It's what's right. Propriety speaks to rightness. And if there's any group of people that ought to be interested in doing what's right, you know who that is? That's Christians. That's Christians. Now, there is a mentality out there in the world that that appears that some people celebrate not being right. I've actually, and I'm ashamed to say this, but I've actually seen that in some of my grandchildren. They put out, they put out a, uh, a dress code. They have assemblies about it. Uh, one of my grandchildren has actually had to call home, get picked up because they weren't complying with it. But then the next day after the assembly, my granddaughter walks down in something that I know she told me they were not allowed to wear, and she's wearing it, and she says, I don't care. That, that's heartbreaking to me. You don't care. It's almost like they enjoy, find delight in defying what is right. But I know she's not alone. But I hope that's not true of us Christians. Friends, we Christians ought to be all focused about what is right. Jesus, in giving us, you know, the qualifications for being citizens of his kingdom, talked about righteousness. This is what you have to do to be right. Friends, he is right. He is perfectly right. And we're supposed to be his followers. Christians ought to be all about doing what is right, doing what is proper, propriety. It ought to be a strong motivation for us. We want to be virtuous people. We want to be doing what is right. And so question, what is right as it relates to remaining productive as members of the Church of Christ. You know what's propriety? You know what's right? You know what's proper? Fitting? Remain productive. God wants us to be working in the church. We gave emphasis to this last week in some of our introductory remarks. But again, friends, the Bible is clear. One of the reasons for which God created the church was to be for it to work. I mean, that's one of the reasons he created it. Ephesians 2 and verse 10 makes this very clear. For we are his workmanship, God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus. Listen to it. Unto good works. Why did God create us in Christ Jesus? For good works. Unto good works. And then he goes on to explain that. Which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. There again is God's prerogative. He tells us. He has appointed, He has ordained ahead of time from eternity what we are to be doing. But We need to ascertain from that verse, God created us in Christ, in the church. He created the church. It's His workmanship, it's creation, it's His handiwork, and it was designed for good works. Let's look at another passage. Uh, I invite you to turn to this one because we're going to be in this context for just a few minutes anyways. Look at Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. We actually alluded to this in our comments there on the Lord's Supper. But look at it again in this context. 
Look at Titus chapter 2 and verse 14. Titus 2 and verse 14. Again, who, it starts out with who, and that pronoun goes back to verse 13, the last words, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ gave Himself for us. Now, the next word is that. And the word that introduces a purpose, introduces a reason. Why did Jesus give Himself for us? Notice, that, number one, He might redeem us from all iniquity. That's one of the reasons Jesus gave Himself for us, died for us on the cross, so that we could be redeemed, bought back from all iniquity. We could be saved from our sins. But friends, it doesn't end there, does it? In fact, it has the conjunction and. Here's another reason. Here's another purpose for which Jesus gave Himself for us so that He could purify, again, through His redemptive blood, He could purify unto Himself a peculiar people. Peculiar today, our vernacular, we think strange. Well, that's all right, but its primary meaning is for His own possession. Jesus gave Himself so that He could redeem us, and then with His redeemed people who are purified, He intended for us to be His own possession. His people. Notice how they're characterized. Zealous of good works. Friends, this peculiar people, this peculiar people belonging to Jesus, for which Jesus died on the cross, they are to be characterized by zealous participation in good works. Zealous. Maybe it's not a word we use a lot today, but it carries with it the idea of a burning desire. If you have a lot of zeal, you have enthusiasm. You have a, sometimes we talk about a fire in us. That is to characterize this people that Jesus gave Himself to procure for Himself. They're supposed to be characterized not only by good works, but being zealously participating in those good works. Friends, this should speak to the propriety of us being found productive, remaining productive in our Christian lives. That's one of the reasons we exist. God explains to us that's one of the purposes for which the church was created, one of the purposes for which Jesus died on the cross in our stead. It certainly ought to characterize us. But then, throughout the New Testament, Christians are regularly being encouraged to remain productive by devoting themselves to good works. And that's why I said you don't have to move from here. We're going to stay here for just a minute. In Titus chapter 3, in this upcoming chapter, three times we're going to find such exhortations. And let me help us understand the context here and how I take it personally. Friends, the inspired penman here is Paul. The recipient is Titus. Titus, like Timothy, was a young preacher, or at least a preacher. And so here is Paul, an apostle, also a preacher, writing to other preachers, telling them what they should be doing, giving them counsel. Well, friends, I'm a preacher. I'm a preacher. And so when I hear the Apostle Paul writing by inspiration, telling preachers of the past, here's what you ought to be doing, I need to take that seriously. Because that means I ought to be doing that. And among other things, listen to what Paul told Timothy was one of his responsibilities. Look at chapter 3 and verse 1. Or I, I said Timothy, I meant Titus. Titus, put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, look at the third one, to be ready to every good work. I have a responsibility, as did Titus as a preacher, to be putting you in mind. You know what the word means? Remember. I'm supposed to be encouraging you. I know you know it. You guys are seasoned Christians. I know you're familiar with what we're talking about here. But I have a responsibility to remind you. 
put you in mind that we ought to be ready to every good work. All right, drop down. Look at chapter 3 and verse 8. This is a faithful saying. These things I will that thou, listen to it, affirm constantly. Paul, writing by inspiration, tells Titus, a preacher, here's something I want you to be giving constant attention to. I think some translations say, I want you to insist on these things. I want you to be compelling them, stressing these things. All right, what, Paul? That they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. As a preacher, I have a responsibility of insisting, stressing to you, constantly affirming to you, we need to maintain good works. Now, that doesn't exclude me. I'm just saying I have that responsibility. And that's one of the reasons for this series. We have to take this seriously. And notice that word careful. You know, when you're careful about something, you give it a lot of attention, right? We're going to give more attention about where we're driving now, Harold, and especially on 17. and <laughs> A lot of deer out there. But careful. The word literally in the Greek is from the word for mind. And so this is talking about, think about these things. Give consideration to them. Be thoughtful about this. Exercise careful thought. About what? Maintaining good works. We all know what it means to maintain something, right? I think in the English word, it literally means to hold on to it. And so the idea of uh, to keep or to keep up. The one I think about, Tracy, I don't know how many of you have done much travel in the, uh, you know, peninsula up there, uh, Hampton Roads area, tunnels everywhere. And you know what some drivers do when they get to the tunnel? You're supposed to be going 60. And people, it starts narrowing down. You don't have any, you don't have any shoulder. You're next to the other person. And so a lot of folks slow down. And you know what happens when you slow down in a tunnel? Which you're not allowed to pass in. So that makes everyone behind you anxious. They're speeding up, trying to get around you before you slow down too much. And so you know what it says when you go in that tunnel? Maintain your speed. It's telling you to keep it up. Don't slow down. Don't let up. And so here is Paul. Titus, you need to be constantly affirming to those that believe in God. They need to be maintaining, keeping up with good works. Good works. It's not the last time. That's, that's what I'm saying. It's hard to get away from this as a preacher. He's told us now that's the purpose the church exists. And then he says you have a responsibility to remind them, to, re, to remind them of keeping up with good works. Yet again, look at verse 14. Verse 14. And let ours, that's us, that's the church, that's Christians, let ours also learn to maintain good works for necessary uses. Look at it. Look at it. That they be not unfruitful. You know what another word for unfruitful is? Unproductive. If you have a garden that's not bearing fruit, it's unproductive. And here is Paul saying, Titus, you have a responsibility to tell your people, to tell the church, to tell fellow Christians that we need to maintain good works because that's the only way we're not going to be unproductive. We're not going to be unfruitful. So you see, you see how often this is put before the church. I read this in Brother, uh, I think it's uh, Shepherd, Brother Shepherd's comments in uh, Brother Lipscomb's commentary. But I thought this was interesting. He says, in these, and he puts quotes around these, the pastoral epistles, those are First and Second Timothy and Titus. And the only reason they're called that is because in the denominational world, a preacher is called a pastor. So they speak of them as pastoral epistles. But I want you to listen to this. In these epistles, we have eight special reminders. Eight. 
to be earnest and zealous in good works. Eight in three letters, and those letters are short letters. Eight reminders for Christians to be engaged and zealous of good works. Here's what Brother Shepherd says. There was evidently in the mind of Paul, as guided by the Holy Spirit, an anticipation that some who profess to be followers of the Lord would content themselves with a dreamy acquiescence in the great truths while living a life that remain unaltered. End of quote. In other words, they wouldn't be productive. They wouldn't be productive. And so as a preacher, I, I got to take it to heart. I got to take it to heart. We are told to keep before the church this constant reminder. We need to be engaged in good works. That's the propriety. That's the right thing to do. It's proper. It's fitting. It's suitable. And even though we're not going to take long to develop this, let me just ask you, who are we as Christians? Acts 11 and 26, who are we? We're disciples of Jesus Christ, right? That means those who sit at His feet and learn. We're learning with the intent of putting those things into practice in our lives. And a perfect disciple, a mature disciple, is one who imitates Jesus. Question, what was Jesus' life all about? Well, if you need an answer, listen to how Peter characterized his life in the house of Cornelius. Listen to how he summarized Jesus' life. Acts 10 and verse 38, Jesus of Nazareth went about doing good. You could summarize Jesus' life in that one statement. He went about doing good. Good works. Jesus was the very epitome of what it means to remain productive. You look at his life. Sometimes you wonder how he could fit all that he did in a day and then in three years. And the book of John really develops this. I mean, we see it at the very outset. Jesus is 12 years old. Remember that incident? Where his, his mother and father left him behind in Jerusalem. They came back to find him three days later. Where was he? He was in the temple. His mother kind of chided him. Why did you do this to us? And you remember what he said? How is it that you sought me? Did you not know that I had to be about my father's business? We get this narrative note, they did not understand the saying which he spake unto them. But we do understand it, don't we? <laughs> because we get to see his life. His life was all about being about the Father's business, remaining productive. And then you go to the book of John and you just listen to how many times Jesus speaks about the work that he was here to accomplish. John 4, verses 32, 34, But he, Jesus said to his disciples, I have meat to eat that you do not know of. They were confused by that. Jesus explained, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. You know why I'm here? You know what motivates me? I'm here to accomplish the Father's work. And it's only propriety for me to be finishing that work. What about John 5 and verse 17? The uh, English Standard Version says, Jesus answered them, my Father is working until now and I am working. I'm working. What about John 9 and verse 4? I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day, the night's coming, when no man can work. And what about his prayer? Right before he goes to the cross, John 17, verse 4. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. Friends, if we claim to be, if we self-identify as the disciples of Jesus Christ, followers, imitators of Jesus, Jesus' entire life was about work, accomplishing the work that his father had given to him. It's what motivated him. It surpassed his desire for physical food when he was hungry, when he was weary. That's what Jesus' life was all about. And for us then to claim to be his followers and not be productive, not live lives wherein we remain productive, you know what that is? That's impropriety. That's unbecoming. That's not fit. It's not right. It's not right. And remember, as the church, remember who we are? As Christians, we're disciples. 
as the church, what are we called? The body of Christ. And so Jesus is back in heaven. And so we, Christians, make up his spiritual body here on earth. What do you think we ought to be doing? Same thing Jesus did while he was here on the earth, right? In fact, he even told his disciples, you will do greater works than I did. Because it would go far beyond what he had done. Now, he did something no one else could do. He died to make salvation possible. But we're the ones responsible for taking that message. Friends, I hope this is a powerful motivator for us as Christians. Just the propriety of this. It's right. It's suitable. It's it's fitting. It's proper. If we claim to be Jesus' disciples, if we claim to be those making up the body of Christ, we ought to live productive lives. We ought to find motivation to remain productive. In fact, we ought to look for opportunities, right? I know it's been a while since we studied Galatians chapter 6, but you remember what that was? Don't grow weary in well-doing. For in due season you'll reap if you don't faint. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all, and especially unto them who are the household of faith. See, we ought to be looking for opportunities. We ought to be looking for opportunities. That's what Jesus did. Jesus just went about his day, and as he saw people who were in need, he saw opportunities to teach. That's what he did. He seized the moment. He took the opportunity to do good. So should we. It's propriety. It's what's right. Well, again, as Christians, I hope this first one is uh, it's a powerful and compelling one. We all want to do what's right as Christians, what is proper and fitting. And it is right as Christians, as members of the Lord's Church, to remain productive. Remain productive. Now, going back to uh, this idea of being right, uh, I hope all of us want to be right with God. That should be true. We shouldn't have this, uh, this mentality of some, well, I, I don't care. Well, one day you will care. We want to be right. And God, again, the great communicator is, He lets us know the only way you can be right today is to be in Christ. The, the Jews of Paul's day tried to do it without Christ. And Jesus and, and Paul explained, you have a great zeal, but it's not according to knowledge. Because God tells you how to be right, and Jesus is the means of righteousness. And friends, if you are not in Jesus Christ today, you're not right with God. He explained, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come unto the Father without me. And then Paul says, the gospel, the gospel is God's power unto salvation. That's how a person becomes right with God. And that gospel teaches us that Jesus came, died in our stead, was buried, and was raised again. And we, in response to that, are to believe those truths about Jesus, and then we are to replicate them. We are to imitate the very things that Jesus did to be right with God, to enjoy the salvation in Christ. And so we, believing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, we die to sin even as Jesus died. We are buried in water, in baptism, even as Jesus was buried in the tomb. And then we are raised from that grave to newness of life, even as Jesus was raised from his tomb following his death and burial.